known as Arun to all of us. Someone who has been doing a lot of work in the open access movement across India. Uh, just to start with, as we go along, you'll know more and more about Arun. His campaigns on open access have been legendary. He's opened eyes to uh, what is the potential of open access, why it is important in the world of academic writing, uh, how it is different but relates to other movements for knowledge openness and knowledge sharing, why it is particularly important for countries like India. Uh, but to start with, to start the first question uh, I'd like to pose to Arun is uh, we often get confused between open access which is your movement, open source, free software, uh, creative commons, uh, many related things. Uh, how would you posit open access against the others? Uh, what is the difference and what is the similarity? Okay. Uh, open source software movement was probably one of the earliest to take place in the openness movement. And uh, uh, like Linus Torvald and even before them, uh, people are thinking of those things. Uh, open access specifically because it involves a large number of uh, scientists and scholars, social scientists, historians, um, and all kinds of uh, scholarly people, uh, mostly academics and also in the laboratory, wherever research is performed. Now, these people produce a lot of uh, new knowledge, as they call it. Uh, in fact, there's a famous uh, of knowledge, um, a three-volume book uh, published by uh, by published from USA long back when I used to teach information science in the 70s. I used to see them, and so this is a well-known area, uh, especially among librarians and information professionals, uh, but more relevant to scientists and scholars, academics, and uh, uh, people performing research in other areas. Uh, law, medicine, and so on. Uh, but for a very long time, what happened was uh, when the new knowledge was produced, um, people used to write what they call papers, research papers, or present them in conferences. These are the two major uh, channels by which knowledge was um, given away to others. And there are others like reports, thesis, and all. But the main ones are journal articles and um uh, conference uh, proceedings so basically basically doctor it would be right to say uh, arun it would be right to say that uh, open access it deals with academic writing uh, deals with academic writing as against open source which deals with software okay open source is for software maybe other things as well open access is largely for uh, academic scholarly writing not necessarily only in the area of science and the other areas which are taught in the liberal universities, but also in law, medicine, and um, uh, innovation and things like that. So uh, uh, you are by and large correct to say it is about academic writing, uh, but it also includes other writing. For example, many people write um, uh, fiction, non-fiction, or uh, uh, journalists and so on. They can make their work open and make it available, freely accessible to people. For example, uh, uh, if I want to scan New York Times, they let me scan a few papers a month, a few uh, articles a month, and then they say, your quota is over, you have to subscribe. Uh, luckily now, the Institute of Science has been given a complimentary subscription, so I get to read free. Otherwise, Hindu, for example, doesn't allow me to read. Of course, I get a paper copy at home, but if you want to refer back to a, uh, an article about a month ago, I don't keep those papers at home. I want to go and check on the net. Hindu doesn't allow me to do it um, for a large number of cases. They allow only a small number per month or something. So, but there are journals like Tribune, for example, in Punjab, Chandigarh. They make they let me read any number of articles they publish. So open access is for journalists as well. And there are some science writers whose articles appear in the paywall newspapers like the Hindu, but they make it accessible through a website, uh, which is a common website for all journalists. Uh, they can put their paper, I mean, you must be knowing, 
but right now I forget the name. Uh, they make it available. So it's not but, 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 but doctor, just to just to uh, explain the basics. Hmm. Uh, open access is a movement which started around. Uh, could you give a little bit of the history when it started yeah, and why okay. it came about? Why it came okay. about so that people okay. could understand what why it's yeah, important. Sure. sure. Um, it started way back, let me say, in modern times, uh, around 1991, I should say, when a person called Paul Ginsberg, a particle physicist at the Los Alamos National Laboratory, uh, wanted to make all particle physics papers easily accessible to particle physicists everywhere in the world. So what he did was, he suggested to particle physicists that if they could send him a copy of the preprint or whatever, he will make it available to people. Remember, it was pre-internet days. There was no uh, net. So he made it available through other means. Uh, later on, when the internet came along, um, uh, it became easier. And then the second major step was around 2001, late November, December. Uh, there was this Budapest uh, uh, Open Access Initiative, uh, largely thanks to George Soros and this Open Science, uh, Open... Um, open Society Foundation. Yeah, Open, open Society, Society Foundation, or OSI, or OSF. And later it became Open Society Foundations and something like that. There are other controversial George Soros, but uh, who has been doing a yeah, lot no, of... Yeah, no, there's a there's controversy. What he gave the money? He gave the money. He, he had a good heart, I should say. Yeah. He had other problems. Let us not worry about that. Doctor, could but you this... move? Uh, could you move your screen a bit so we could see your face? Yeah, yeah. Otherwise, it's uh, you know no, it's half. Yeah, uh, yeah. Closer, they... or maybe maybe yeah, a bit so that your face moves up. Yeah, now it's fine. Now it's fine. Carry on. Okay. Carry okay. On. Carry on. Okay. Yeah. So you were saying George Soros uh, supported yeah, the Soros. Uh, he supported, and he convened a meeting. Open Society Foundation convened a meeting in Hungary in Budapest. They invited 16 people, including their own staff. So these 16 people met for a couple of days, and then they decided what we should do about making knowledge freely accessible to people. And that was a, a kind of, a, a, I want to say, a lot of arguments and so on. And uh, out of the 16 people, one person uh, was in favor of making things available through repositories. The others were all conventional people, I should say. They have been used to seeing papers in journals, and therefore, they wanted to continue the journals. Now, um, 15 against 1. But Dr. Harnard, Professor Harnard, Stephen Harnard, a cognitive scientist, at that time working in Southampton, and uh, also having a dual citizenship in Canada and UK, he prevailed. He said, let us compromise, we will have both. And said, but the repository should be the first priority and then the general. So, so basically, the, we are talking about uh, academic writing, yeah. which, uh, which would be shared rather than sold in, in, yeah. in, in the commercial sense. So yeah. the open access movement is trying to make academic writing accessible to everyone. Yeah, rather than, rather, rather than uh, selling it at a very high cost. Yeah, high cost or low cost, no cost they wanted. Yeah, they wanted to make it available at no cost. Now, um, the open access journals they wanted to um, create at that time, there was no open access journal. So, the, the, the 16 wise people who met at Budapest decided they should, they should find a way by which new journals, which are called open access journals, could be started. And in the meanwhile, um, Harnard put up this proposal and said, we will have the repository. And the moment he went back to Southampton, they started working. He put together a small team of young fellows and created what's called a software for repositories, archiving self, archiving uh, things. Uh, okay, what, I, what I missed something. What was it Se called? Self archiving. Yeah. Uh, uh, the, the, the process is called self archiving. I write a paper, I myself archive it. Yeah. 
For that, he created a software called ePrints, capital E, capital P, R I N T S, ePrints. Not he, his team, the young fellows. Uh, some of them are still there in Southampton. Okay, uh, ePrints. This is the first open access software ever to be produced in the world. Uh, it was somewhere around 2001, maybe 2000, let us say 2000. I can get the correct date offhand, I cannot tell you, around that time, ePrints. And uh, then MIT and uh, uh, one company, I think HP or somebody, they started working on that and they made uh, what's called uh, uh, D space, D capital, S capital, P A C E, D space. They started on that. And then there are so many now. There are at least 15 or 20 different software available today for making things open uh, in academia. So, uh, Fedora, for example, uh, uh, there's so many others now. And uh, in the uh, along that, there are people who started open access journals. One of them was um, uh, a, a, journal, a company called BMC, Biomed Central. Uh, Vic Trax, his name is Vic Trax, a Jewish guy. Uh, Vic Trax, T-R-A-C-Z, I think. Vic Trax. Uh, Victor Trax or something, but uh, people call him Vic, Vic Trax. And uh, Vic Trax started his company in London. And uh, with some uh, started with about 20 or 30 biology journals. And uh, uh, 20 or 30 biology journals. Yeah, right. Okay. Today, the company, uh, he sold it to somebody else. Now they are running more than 300 journals. Uh, it grew very fast. What so, was that called? What uh, was that called again? BMC, Biomed Central. Biomed Central. Bio for biology, med for medicine. Yeah. Uh, central is my operation being centralized, Biomed Central. He's a very brilliant guy and a great businessman. He had uh, academic ideas and business mind. He's something like uh, uh, Gene Garfield, a combined uh, intellectual prowess with business uh, competence. Doctor, a bit of distance from your screen because we can't see your full face. And uh, oh, we are no, I... Now you see okay? Yeah. Better. Okay, okay. Uh, okay, great. Uh, uh, Vic Trax and Gene Garfield are two iconic figures. Uh, although Garfield is far better known than Trax, but Trax deserves some importance because he thought of open access journals and created an organization and made them freely accessible to people. And I had visited an office in London. It was very small, two rooms only, and there were about 20, 30 people working, but uh, they produced the marvelous stuff at that time. Very path breaking, very path breaking and changing the way knowledge is yeah, created and that. shared in the world. Trax. I mean, I actually, in my opinion, he is not as well known as he should be. Of course, we all know Dr. Garfield. I mean, everybody talks about him because he produced so many other products also. What's the site? Uh, we are talking about DSpace or this is the next site? No, no, again, please. Uh, what is the site that they produced? No, what the is second, their website? The second, the second person is yeah. called Eugene Garfield. Eugene, yeah. like yeah. Eugene O'Neill. Eugene yeah. Garfield, the cat Garfield. Right, right. Yeah, Garfield, he created an organization called Institute for Scientific Information. Yeah. He started as a chemical information person. Even when a PhD student uh, in Colombia, not a PhD student, as a, a master's student in Colombia, he wrote a paper in 1955 in science about the idea of citation and how um, all knowledge can be linked. Uh, or oh, this is Garfield, yeah, you are right. Yeah. So he created that. He is a genius, outstanding human being, absolutely top class brilliant. If there were a Nobel Prize in this area, he should have been the first to get it. He, is called a, uh, he was called an information scientist, uh, but he is far more than an information scientist. Uh, he's a great humanist. Uh, he made some money, but he also donated a lot of money to different causes. Actually, he is a kind of a, a mixture of a capitalist and a communist, both. Uh, he derives his capitalism from two of his uncles. Uh, he, he lost his father in the sense he deserted his mother and uh, children and went away. Okay. So 
uh, his mother was taken care of by some other person and uh, his uncles uh, were living with them or close by and the, uh, one of the two uncles were in business some kind of business and uh, uh, one of them was in business one of them was kind of a socialist so he drew uh, sustenance from both of them uh, simultaneously acquired a taste for both capitalism and socialism and that it reflected throughout his life he made money and he also gave away to good causes. Doctor, a little okay. bit distance from the screen, please. Okay. A little okay. distance from the screen. Okay. I'm well, sorry, I'm not used okay. to this. Okay. No problem. Okay. No okay. problem. Okay. It's oh, fine. Now. now it's okay? Yep. Okay. Fine. okay. So, Darcy introduced um, a revolution in searching information. Uh, like, if you want to find out a paper that is relevant to your work, Suppose you are working in, say, some neurological problems, say, uh, research in Alzheimer's disease, for example. Uh, you would like to see the latest papers written by others. Now that there are hundreds of journals, it becomes impossible for you to go to a library and search all the journals. Now, the originally what they did was, they used to have what, what are called abstracting journals. Uh, for each field, there used to be an abstracting journal or more. Uh, for example, for there was what is called, uh, um, now it's called Medline. Um, the olden days it was called um, Biomed? No. Oh, no, no. I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll let you later when I remember. Medline. And also there was one by the company which is now called Elsevier. They also produced one. Okay. There were yeah. two at that time. Uh, the one was produced by NIH, National Institute of Health in, uh, New, in, uh, in uh, USA. Uh, that is the most important one. The LCO one is a commercial one, but it is uh, much smaller, but they had big money anyway. Medlards, Medlards probably. I'm good. Medlards is a later one. Okay. That's a later name. The original one is something okay. PubMed. Uh, PubMed. 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 Okay. PubMed. Okay, they made it. Medlar, PubMed, uh, the, 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 the series. Uh, they made a company also with the facilities and so on. Came on later. That's it. Fine. Perfect. No, it's uh, okay. You can, you can, yeah, yeah. You can see in the screen how exactly you would appear. So, uh, sorry, sorry to our viewers uh, for the for the interruption. Uh, we had a bit of a technical glitch. Apart from that, the east coast of India is is facing is facing a oh, cyclone oh. today, uh, and uh, and the, the the bandwidth was a bit low, but now it seems to be fine. So we'll okay. hold on in it. Today evening we are talking with Subaya Arunachalam about the benefits of open source, the his open access. Sorry the history of the movement, how it came about, what it means for, for academia in all parts of the world, particularly in countries like India. And in the first part of our session, before this small gap, uh, Subaya Arunachalam, or Arun as we all know him, uh, who has been a very prominent pioneer and promoter of open access in India and in different parts of the world, uh, has been telling us about the roots of the movement and where it came about. Okay, we, we, we don't want to clutter the debate with too many technical terms. Uh, because all the pointers are there on the net and you can easily find out what's the meaning of uh, gold open access, green root, whatever it is, all these technical concepts which I myself get confused about. But uh, Arun will also uh, has been explaining to us the history of the movement and where it started and from where it grew from the 1990s till it made a tremendous impact on academic publishing worldwide. So uh, apart from the history, which, which maybe we could recommend the open access page on Wikipedia for people who want to find more to find out more about. Apart from that, Arun, could you tell us uh, why it is relevant, particularly to countries like India? Why is it important? We we have commercial models. We have people who have been selling uh, academic knowledge for ages. They've been making a ton of money out of it. Profits are huge. Sometimes at obscene uh, rates of returns. Uh, why is open access important, particularly in third world, so-called third world countries? Please go. On. The number of people doing research or number of people who are in the business of knowledge. I mean, we are not, I'm not, I don't mean business, I mean in the activity of creating knowledge or sharing knowledge uh, is constantly growing because they are increasing in education budgets, uh, building new laboratories, uh, building new universities, building new institutes of technology, uh, and so on. And new laboratories and different uh, 
akhirnya saya like, saya saya dia saya DBT dan so on. So uh, as more and more people coming to coming to do research, uh, volume of research production also increases. So we do a lot of research. I do a lot of research. We need to know a lot of research in the world. So this activity is done essentially by standing on the shoulders of giants, as Sir Isaac Newton said ages ago. So if you want something, if you want to see, if you stand up on the shoulders of giants, if you stand up on a, a two-story building, you can see them. So the idea is, already there have been people have done something, you make use of it and go further. That's the idea. So you need to know what has been by others, not only here, but also elsewhere, not only now, but also in the past. So across time and space, what you have done, the way of product of knowledge, should be accessible to you, so you can produce new knowledge. This is the basic idea of knowledge production. Now, to be able to do that, you need to get all these things, from the exposure, all these pieces and so on.
some of uh, the final points you were making okay okay so you say countries like india south africa yes okay uh, in these countries a large number of people are doing research and the number is constantly increasing therefore they need access to information to do research uh, because everybody needs information access to be able to do research and now um, the conventional way of providing this information information access is through journals that cost a lot of money now these countries obviously cannot afford that much money when the when the number was small they could afford when the numbers increase they cannot now that problem is faced and also the inflation and things like this all is happening and it becomes more and more difficult if things were available for free that to that extent uh, one can do research faster better okay so 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 you are saying they should be available for free then the question comes up if they are available for free who pays for them yes good question yeah now let us take a group of people who do research let us say 100 people are doing research these 100 people can exchange what they do with each other this is exactly what Paul Ginsberg was doing when Paul Ginsberg started uh, what is called archive, A R capital X I V archive, A R capital X I V archive. So this was started in Los Alamos National Laboratory, where Paul Ginsberg was a junior physicist, was an young fellow. He started it. At that time. Um, People used to send um, by what all means by post or fax or whatever. Okay, in those days it was telex. Maybe he sent they sent them. There was no net at that time. Okay, so he was able to share it with so many other physicists. To that extent, they did not have to wait for journal, but they all could get what others were doing. Right now, archive has completed 30 years, a little more than 30, and there are more than two million papers in that. Two million preprints, what they call preprints. A paper is something which is published after review in a journal and things like that. They call it a preprint. Before so it is published, two million. It, uh, you can you submit a copy before it is edited and published. Yeah, yeah, to, yeah. You are right. As soon as you finish your research, if you think it is worth publishing, instead of sending it to a journal, you send it to archive, and then it will be seen by so many people. And there are some questions at that time. If it is not reviewed by others, anybody can send junk. 
what would happen then yeah. it it was it was not a good question because if hundreds and thousands of people are going to see what i write i would be careful not to send junk i wouldn't like to, uh, like to be looked at as an idiot so i would self censor myself before i put a paper especially when i know thousands of people are seeing that every day so that's that is one check and another is um you will get caught very soon if you publish junk twice or thrice i mean I, I, people would come to know then nobody would look at your paper later on so you would lose your uh, uh credit or credibility. credibility so that's yeah. so it never happens that way recently there was some research uh, at least two papers i have seen recently uh, where they checked what was published in a preprint archive and what was published later in a reviewed journal more than 90% or 85% of those were almost the same only in a few cases there was minor or uh, somewhat more modifications so preprint archives are as good as that also there have been many cases where from reviewed journals uh top journals like nature uh, papers are withdrawn by authors after um, others pointed out errors so all this reviewing is the only kind of um, a facade it doesn't really work that well so on both sides from the archive side more than 85% of papers that appear in archive do not get changed at all when they go and get published in the journal and from the journal side interesting yeah 100 interesting yeah, please sorry 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 doctor carry on okay hundreds of papers which are published in review journals have been withdrawn re- uh, retracted they call it retracted there is a journal called retraction something where they uh, document all these things right very interesting uh, very interesting and it's uh, fascinating to see the different pages of archive which we are which we have also yeah, yeah, been yeah. trying to do uh, while we were talking but uh, at the same time uh, Pro- uh, arun uh, bring that brings us to the question of open access and in india yeah. what has been its history what has been its role what has okay. been its acceptance what has been its problem okay your sound is coming through perfect if we can see a little bit of your face ah. more of your face that would be even better ah, now it's okay and yeah now it's perfect now both sound and image are perfect okay, please okay. carry on now, i have a back problem so i tend to <laughs> okay, okay, no no okay. it's okay no problem okay, okay sorry okay no no no, no don't worry i am 80 plus so <laughs> yeah, yeah okay yeah, yeah. now um um uh, honestly india india, india, india okay yeah india um i think they were, they, perhaps the earliest voice from india was mine um True. my first uh, uh, public talk on open access was in rio de janeiro in 2000 middle rio in rio um yeah uh, there is a person called abel packer he was heading um PAHO, P-A-H-O, which is kind of a WHO subsidiary in South, South America. He's a Brazilian, uh, speaking Portuguese and a little bit of English. He was looking for an international uh, meeting. It is the International Federation of Science Editors meeting. He was looking for somebody from Asia. There was hardly anybody you could locate. Then he, there was a medical editor. uh was a bahai was driven out of iran went to uh, some latin american country chile or mexico or some place a uh, momen mr dr momen he talked to momen and momen talked to a person called sayed etasham hasan in india a, a very highly reputed biologist and then sayed hasan suggested you could call arun so then they found out and called me would you please come uh, then i went there this was in which year 2000 2000 yeah about 22 years ago uh, that was my first public talk but my colleague a friend of mine called gunasekaran he tells me sir you have already talked talked about it even before that but i am not able to locate anything now because all my correspondence uh, when i was in swaminathan foundation was done from their address mssrf mail 
but I'm not able to trace any of them now because all the okay. colleagues have left and they don't know which server where. Okay, they were not very highly proficient in computers like you are. You are able to locate immediately everything. They were not able to do all that. So in those days, it was tough. Also in those days, actually, I no one knew which uh, you know post boxes we could not store like I know, email. They, 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 the server could have had, but they didn't. Okay. I don't know. They they missed everything and I lost everything there. Doesn't matter. It's okay. uh, but I remember most of those things. So this was okay. the first official talk I gave. And I could send you the talk uh, in a couple of days. I have to search for it and then yes, send you. Please, do, I will do that. Do. That would be. Very I will do that. Yeah. That was my first talk, where I actually talked about OAI. That was a wrong abbreviation because it means something else. What I thought was open access um, uh, initiative. Uh, initiative. Initiative or something. Initiative. No, no, no. Yeah. Uh, something like a repository or uh, uh, something okay. like that. So I mentioned that that. So. I yeah. spoke about it, and then uh, before then, even before I went to uh, Brazil, I had invited yeah. Professor Stephen Harnard to come to India uh, to celebrate the 75th birthday of Dr. Eugene Garfield. See, I am called an information scientist for whatever reason, and Garfield happens to be the number one information scientist of a whole century or generation. So I thought I should uh, honor him, and I uh, hosted a meeting in Swaminathan Foundation. Although it is not the, the Swaminathan Foundation is essentially for development; they have nothing to do with information. But Swaminathan was very kind. He said, "Okay, I won't go ahead." And then I even asked him money. So he said, "I don't have money." Then he said, "Okay." He called somebody from Larson and Tubru and asked for some money, and uh, he, he gave some money. So I was able to bring Stephen Harnard and another person called Alan Gilchrist from London. In that, before I invited him because I had read Stephen Harnard's paper called um, uh, "Scholarly Skywriting." Scholarly Skywriting. The idea was, uh, if you if you put up in a paper or a or a blackboard, only people who can access that paper were. Uh, see that paper can read, but if you put it on the sky, something like a star, everybody can look up and see that. So he said, "Scholarly sky writing." So I mean, fantastic uh, phrase he used. That uh, that paper I had read, although uh, in the first reading I did not understand uh, fully. I, I got some idea, but not fully. Because my own preparation was not that good at that time, but I knew there is something fantastic there. So I I said, "You should come." He agreed. So I raised some money from British Council and from Larson and Tubro and all. Uh, all the meetings I ever conducted without any money. I I have I have no power. I don't have money, but I always depended upon some agency, and most of the people helped me. So I am very grateful to all of them. He came there and he gave a talk. Yeah, that talk took place after I gave a talk in Brazil. I met Harnard for the first time in Brazil face to face. And he was upset. You have been asking me to come to India, but when is the meeting? Tell me, tell me. Is it? I told him, look, I invited you out of my enthusiasm, but I have to gather some money to invite you. How would I pay for your hotel? How would I pay for your airfare? So I have no money. I'm waiting for the money to come. And then he said, oh, I see. Uh, do it quickly, he said. Luckily, I could organize that in 2000 itself. He came. That is how. I, so I, I had been having this idea even before 2000. Ever since I read, and not fully understood the paper of Harnard. Anyway, that's okay. Then uh, that was the first time. Then when I came back uh, in the Institute of Science, two of my friends, uh, Dr. Ralph Shaker, and uh, now Dr. Francis at that time, Mr. Francis J. Con. They were working hard to set up repositories, both for uh, research papers and for uh, a thesis. Um, um, they, they were they used ePrint software to set up a repository for the Institute of Science papers only. They used that. That came around. Institute of Science in Bangalore. Institute of yeah, Science in Bangalore. Bangalore. That came in two thousand two. 
they started work in 2001 actually the work was virtually done by francis okay although uh, rat checker was the head of the unit and he had some ideas but the work was done entirely by francis in the name of a trainee student it's francis who francis jacon uh, 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 let us not go into the details now because it's a very sad story huh? okay francis jacon is one of the most outstanding human beings a true christian i am an atheist but i have great respect for him he is a true christian he, he believes in the lord and uh, uh, he doesn't do anything unethical in his life he is so honest even when people harmed him he would not do any uh, hatred for them such a nice gentleman and uh, he was ill treated by the institute of science for a very long time he was not promoted at all all his juniors all his students were already full fledged librarians in universities at the grade of a professor and this man was till recently as an assistant the institute of science all many of them were my friends the directors the deputy directors I, I i i don't know what to say they, they never did anything or toil for him which is which is a, a blasphemous i should say anyway but he did fantastic work and even today he is doing that he's a remarkable human being i mean the country should honor such people uh, rather than the tendulkars and the, you know I mean, people who really work hard i mean people who really produce something worthwhile uh, under great adversity conditions of adversity okay. they set it up first the actual setup was done by francis and that team uh, and i forget the name of the student but i will remember it is, there is a paper i can remember that but i was talking about it but he was doing that that credit should be given to him Okay, now this is which year? Two thousand two. It came up in two thousand two. That okay. that history is there. Uh, history of that Indian Institute of Science uh, Open Access Repository is there. It's available. Okay, it's recorded. Okay, uh, the student was there in two thousand one and two thousand two. Uh, that's a one and a half year course, and the thesis work was given to him the last six months, and. Uh, um, Uh, although it was in the, the thesis was in the name of the student, I am sure it was done by Francis. Okay, anyway, um, uh, um, okay, that's the first thing. And they also did another using D space for thesis. Two things they did. The, the, this was the first. E print was the first, and then D space also. This is because they were training students. They wanted them to be, acquire skills. So that was a remarkable program. NCSI, National Center for Science Information. Uh, about it, I will tell you some other day. Uh, uh, okay, that, that was the one. And later, of course, uh, when Harvard and others came to my institute uh, foundation here, Swami Nathan Foundation, uh, we conducted several workshops. I brought two people from UK, uh, one from UK, one from Canada, uh, and. Uh, again in the name of swaminathan foundation indian academy of sciences and the indian institute of science three big names i had so both sponsoring uh, two back to back three day workshops on electronic publishing the two people were from what is called the electronic publishing trust ept okay they they were trustees of ept uh, later on i also became a trustee um, Uh, they came and conducted two three-day workshops, and 25 people each. Total of 50 people were trained in electronic publishing from various uh, uh, government organizations, private publishers, and all. Out of them, one of them became a world leader, I should say. Uh, he's he's a Bombay. He's a doctor, a pediatrician from K E M College. K no K M Hospital, yeah uh, K M Hospital, yeah. and uh, said G S Medical College or something attached to the hospital. He did an M D in pediatrics. His name is D K Sahu S A H U D K Sahu. Hardly anything you will find on the net. He, he has simply vanished. Nobody knows where he is. Okay. Uh, in fact, I'm kind of afraid. That something wrong must have happened. I mean, I don't know what. Otherwise, he would not remain incommunicado with me. He's such a close friend. 
uh, he has helped me a lot uh, in my international travels in Bombay. Whenever I went for visa or uh, travel and all, he used to arrange for a taxi, arrange for a guest house. He'll come in person and help me and all. But later on, I, I completely lost touch with him, and nobody knows where he is. Now. I remember, I remember Sahu, Doctor Sahu, who was a who was a pediatrician, and along the way, he discovered uh, that he liked publishing more. Yeah, same man. And he pioneered this. Same man. He pioneered this series. Med, yeah, Med young no. man series. Medno. Medno. Yeah, Med, same man. He, Pioneer, pioneered the series of uh, about maybe three dozen, thirty-six or thirty-five. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Now, of course, it was taken by um, uh, yeah. uh, another uh, European publisher. Is now we are having three hundred uh, journals, and this European yeah. publisher threatened him actually. One by one, he was withdrawing the societies from him, and then he saw the complete thing would collapse, and forced him to sell at a low price, along with all the software, along with all the. No how and all. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Not only the name, everything. I mean, it was ridiculous. He did that. His publisher. Anyway, this is how the publishers work. That is why I hate them actually. These commercial publishers, I I, yeah. I hate them literally. Okay. They can be very cutthroat, very cutthroat. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. Uh, and, uh, I mean, uh, for people like us, uh, uh, unimaginable things are happening like that. Okay. Anyway. It is it is one set of people who build up the assets, and it's someone else who controls yeah, yeah. it finally. So. Sahu was trained by us. For the, I see. Okay. Okay. Well, he was already doing things. He was already publishing journals. That is how he yeah. came to our workshop. Then he learned about yeah. this from these two experts and went back and converted yeah. to open access and things like that. So, and he became. He was quite uh, grateful to me and was always uh, uh, kind. Of, he looked up to me as some kind of a benefactor. Although I he's see. far ahead in his knowledge, in his competence, in his skills, in his computing skills, in his knowledge. Medical knowledge, everything. But for some reason, yeah. he thought I did something good for him, and he was very grateful to me. And I, 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 because because you all also build a ideological justification and and uh, rationale for the promotion of this movement, isn't it? What about in that? You know, uh, once when I was invited to a conference, I used to be invited for almost every conference in West uh, well, our workshop. Once I was invited to Italy for a meeting yeah. in a, a medium-sized town. I forget the name now. Uh, that town has uh, one of the oldest universities in the world. Some 850 years, 900 years old universities there. Padua, Padua, maybe Padua, no, maybe, Padua okay. maybe Turin, or some some okay. some okay. university. Uh, okay. Uh, I don't have records because all the records are there. They must have a machine. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay, anyway. And I also have Alzheimer's, so I forget things. Okay, no problem. Yeah. Uh, there were 10 years ago, uh, I would have real facts and figures with the uh, uh, to the tenth decimal, but now I remember. I remember that. Yeah, I remember now that. I am, I am right. having this uh, uh, neuro problem. It doesn't matter. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. Uh, anyway, I am in the uh, good doctor care as well as family care. No problem. Okay. 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 Now, uh, I took him. I told the organizers, uh, uh, it's not uh, just me. Uh, I would like to uh, bring a colleague of mine. Uh, you should pay yeah. for him as well. They said, by all means, they said. So they paid for both airfare as well as uh, residence and food, everything they paid for both. Yeah. We went there. Luckily, both of us are vegetarians. So he is a Jain, I think. I, I don't know, I but I, think, I, I guess he's a Jain. So uh, he is also a vegetarian. So we searched for vegetarian food <laughs> together. We explored. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. And, uh, uh, and he introduced him to a lot of people. And uh, he was even interviewed by, uh, what is his name? Uh, Ricky Point, Pointer later on. So I gave him a lot of connections. Whomever I knew, I introduced him. Uh, it was very good for him for that, that visit. Uh, he is one of the great pioneers of open access in India. Later yeah. on, he conducted a meeting in that uh, what that college attached to KM Hospital. What is it? St. GS Medical College. What is it called? In Parel. Probably, I think, I think St. GS okay. Medical College. In that college, he is a superstar. Every professor liked him. Every professor right. liked him. He organized a meeting to which all the international leaders of open access came. I was able to help him and he brought. And he put us all up in a cricket control board guest house, CCI, in a five star hotel overlooking the sea. I mean, I said, why are you spending so much money, Sahu? I asked him. And he said, sir, you are all great people. This is a little thing I should tell you. 
such a generous person, I tell you. Right. Okay, anyway, he came. Uh, he is one of the great pioneers in open access in India. He created new software for editing and publishing and all. All that he gave away to this commercial publisher, who owns it now. Um, anyway, uh, yeah. Uh, then, uh, in around 2004, 2005 or six, I convened an international conference uh, workshop. But then I thought, what is the point only doing in India? It should be for all of developing world, particularly China. So then I wrote to China and I said, if half a dozen people from China could come and attend our workshop, it would be good. Together, we can promote openness in our region. And I also invited people from South Africa, from Brazil, um, and uh, the other developing countries in uh, East Asia, except Pakistan, because I couldn't do that at that time. I wanted to, yeah. but uh, it was not possible to invite people from Pakistan at that time. So a lot of people came. Uh, and uh, six people I invited from China, five could come, one could not come, he couldn't because the uh, visa was, uh, the approval from Indian government went late after the conference started. So uh, for all five of them, we paid for travel, for hotel, uh, including the visa charges, everything we paid, including the local travel charges from the hometown to Beijing airport. So I organized everything. So uh, similarly, uh, the man who invited me to the 2000 conference, Abel Packer, he came from Brazil to give their experience. And uh, uh, two outstanding ladies, one person called Alma Swan from England, was a farmer, a biochemist or biotechnologist from Southampton, and another lady called uh, Barbara Kissa, who passed away a few months ago. They came and we produced what is called the Bangalore Declaration for Open Access, which unfortunately... Bangalore Declaration, yeah. 2005, which year? 2005 2000? or six. that I can check and okay. tell you tomorrow. Okay. 2005, uh, uh, you can even check on the net sometimes. Uh, yeah. Bangalore Declaration, that meeting, that was an outstanding meeting. Yeah. Uh, uh, several professors in the Institute of Science attended the meeting. And uh, uh, you know this Lawrence Leon? Yeah. Yeah. He gave a keynote about uh, what is it called uh, uh, shadow libraries and things like that. Actually, there's a shadow library meeting on the 12th. Uh, I am attending that meeting on the next. Okay. So, what's a shadow uh, library? What's a shadow, shadow library? library? The concept is, and uh, there are several things which are not easily accessible. Either they are banned or they are uh, uh, proscribed, uh, things like that, and. Um, uh, or they are under copyright, and uh, so it's not easily accessible, but make them available to people. That's shadow library. So uh, they're very closely related to openness. Okay, on the, I'll send you a link. On the 12th, that's a meeting. It's about an hour or two. Um, I have it marked at 6.30 p.m. Indian Standard Time. A shadow library, 6.30 p.m., 12th of May. In another, 12th is, Today is 10th or 11th? Today is the 11th actually. Okay, tomorrow. The meeting is tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Tomorrow. Tomorrow is the meeting. So uh, I'll pass on the link after I finish the conversation here. You can register. So yeah. uh, that meeting was one of the most successful meetings I organized because it took the message to several countries and uh, 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 and of course, it took time for everybody to actually uh, do things about it, but they yeah, just uh, learned about open access and uh, uh, the importance of it and so on. Secondly, I went to China four times to promote open access to the uh, Chinese Academy and other other organizations. Did they catch the point fast? Uh, there was a problem of language. So what I did was in Bangalore meeting, I nominated four or five students to sit by the side of those Chinese people. And then as when the others speak for two, three minutes, then they'll give a gist of that in very slow English. These people don't know Chinese. 
guidance is to not like this. So, no, Uh, uh, he has done a lot of work 
watchers and he, his group has developed a software machine judge. PKP, yes. PKP is public knowledge. Public knowledge. PKP. Open, yes. Open your systems. Open your yeah. systems. Now, what is So, 
So I'm going to do this case. Most people have a little bit You have a little bit of 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 Uh, 
Kavita Zambi had to support the throne. The salary that we pay is so little. So he left us and went home. Uh, first, he went to France for six months. And he came to Hyderabad. And to Little South, he went to Commonwealth of Rain, where he is now in Kerala. Right, yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, and he deserves to be. He's a very brilliant guy. Yeah. 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 And he knows about music. Every time I meet him, he, he shows a new face. Every time I had not known. I see. I think he knows. Anyway, uh, he started open access in Pikisan. Um, because of my Pikisan. I have been telling him about it. He started to come and he was talking. Then I went there. Then I said, look, I am not good at implementation. I am I'm an advocate, but if you want somebody to work with computers and show things, you should bring ARD Prasad. ARD Prasad is uh, still to die, but teaching language and information science in a place called DRTC. DRTC is Documentation Research Training Center. It is part of the ISI, famous ISI. Yeah. Oh, 
previously served in the Pentecost. Thank <laughs> you. 